So it's very short. Uh, one of the very good friends of the conference here in the heap space. He has been here from the basically first time we appeared, and he will tell you how not to do DevOps. So, Mr. Nemet. Hi. Uh, I give maybe 10 seconds for others who want to join. Well. So as a quick start, uh, how many of you have uh, participated in uh, DevOps transformation of an organization? Well, yeah, there's a few, okay. Uh, maybe there are others who already joined an organization who, are, who were already doing DevOps. Any of those here? So who work for, yeah, cool. Okay, <laughs> so um, I did uh, the transformation part and I've seen uh, some others. So I'm here to tell you a few experiences about this. Um, a few words about me. I'm 39. I'm a geek since I remember, which means that I started programming on uh, Commodore 64 when I was about six, something like that. And um, I'm married and I'm father of two kids. One of them had a birthday yesterday, so. Um, and I uh, have the tendency to make people start programming around me, which means, for example, my wife, uh, who has been always a journalist, just started to learn programming in a boot camp. So she is now learning Java and becoming a programmer at this age. So I think that's very cool. Um, I joined Ustream in quite the early days. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Ustream, what it is? Okay, I will tell you a bit more about it then. So I, I joined a bit after the start, back in 2010, and I've been with them ever since. It's been a, a, an interesting journey for our, from a, a small startup beginning uh, to the IBM acquisition. So the Budapest Ustream office is now IBM Budapest Lab. I've done operations development, mostly development, some operations also. Uh, and in the last five years, I do a lot of management. Uh, so uh, I think these can be a good mix, as uh, the previous talk was about. So a um, few words about Ustream and where we come from. So this is the NASA channel broadcasting from the International St Space Station. We do live streaming. Uh, that's, that's our main profile. We do it uh, since 2007. Well, that was where the company was founded by two Americans and a Hungarian. So the setup was always like we had engineering in Budapest and business in San Francisco. Uh, originally, it was a, a free s a service for people who wanted to broadcast, like basically YouTube for live streams. Uh, it was supported by advertisements. And then we moved gradually towards more professional use cases. First, uh, we just uh, launched self-serve uh, pro broadcasting packages, which, which is for uh, small companies, uh, small organizations doing events. But then uh, we moved to, towards the enterprise market, targeting uh, internal company communication and uh, uh, some other uh, professional use cases. This eventually led to the IBM acquisition. So as I already mentioned, IBM acquired Ustream in early 2016. Uh, so since then, uh, it's been uh, uh, like two years of constant, continuous change for us. First of all, uh, we were merged with another acquired company called Clearleap to form a new business unit within IBM 
Clilip is based in Atlanta and they do uh, OTT based uh, video distribution, basically video distribution for large media companies like HBO. So these two companies were merged together to create cloud video business unit within IBM Cloud. Later on, this was transformed into uh, what is now called Watson Media. So actually, at the moment, I work for uh, Watson, Watson Cloud Platform and Watson Media. But that's changing like every two weeks. So um, what's not changing is that we became the Budapest lab of IBM. So this is the first Hungarian software lab of IBM, which means uh, we enjoy a bit more autonomy. We work on, on the projects with our own methodologies and we don't have to follow uh, the strict standards of uh, a sales and delivery organization typically has. Um, two interesting data points here uh, about the Ustream code base. It's 10 million lines of code, as last I checked. So it's... Uh, comparable to like Firefox or, or uh, double of the Linux kernel. Uh, so it's uh, quite complicated stuff. Of course, probably there are, there's a lot of code in there which is not needed anymore, but you know how it is. And then we run this complex code base in, in like dozens of uh, services which communicate with each other. and. Uh, we run them on, on hundreds of, of servers. We started using containers. We started using Kubernetes, which we just heard about two talks ago. So all of it, really. Um, this is the obligatory marketing slide about what, what our products are. I, I don't think I want to go into details on this, but essentially we have uh, three product, uh, product portfolios. One is uh, the streaming portfolio, which is about live streaming and, and online video use cases for uh, enterprise companies for internal and external communication. We have the media portfolio, which is about uh, video processing and distribution for media companies. And then we have uh, the Watson-based uh, products, which is currently video enrichment, and others are coming which is using the Watson uh, APIs uh, in relation for, uh, with video or other media. The video enrichment is about finding out interesting metadata about your content. So for example, scene detection or object recognition, stuff like that. So that's, uh, uh, that's enough about Ustream. So a few words about the DevOps transition in general. So what, what is DevOps actually? A few of you, I'm sure, already knows it, but there's some terms frequently used up there. So like, automate all the things, and then you build it, you run it, and some other slogans. Basically, uh, DevOps is uh, what I call uh, an offspring of the Agile movement. By that I mean, that it, uh, its goals are similar to increase uh, development and delivery efficiency via applying cultural and methodology changes to the organization. It actually came into life uh, in an Agile conference. The first paper mentioning DevOps was called Agile Infrastructure back in 2008. And then um, it became widespread popularity uh, in the coming years. So um, I just wanted to uh, quote uh, a definition from Gene Kim, who is an, an important author about DevOps. He says that DevOps is the set of cultural norms and technical practices that enable organizations to have a fast flow of work from development through tests and deployment while preserving world-class reliability, availability, and security. That's, that's it. So essentially, it's a, a set of cultural norms. That's the most important piece, and then technical practices. And the goal is similar to uh, Agile. 
So the DevOps transformation is a cultural change. Um, you have to come together and uh, become a team of cool Lego ninjas, uh, regardless of your background. So I chose this picture here because now here we have a blue ninja, a white ninja, who is also an android, and then a red ninja and a darker red ninja together forming a team. That's the, one of the basic ideas of, of the DevOps movement, have cross-functional teams. So there's one of each important knowledge area in this team, as you see on the, on the slide. You have to, of course, to achieve this, you have to build some trust between these. For example, why would uh, a fire ninja trust uh, an earth ninja? Uh, I mean, how would they understand each other? So all this DevOps transition is about uh, communication and building uh, some understanding of each other. Of course, and the next step is building ownership and responsibility for the code base you build. Uh, you do this with sharing the knowledge about it and also with sharing the knowledge about the customers and about what they expect from that code base. You, you redefine the traditional roles. You don't have traditional operations people anymore. You have uh, everyone on duty and you have everyone responsible. And of course, the, the DevOps transition is also about tooling. You uh, implement a bunch of these. Uh, I won't go into many details on this. There's a lot of great talks about all these tool sets you could utilize. But the idea is that uh, you get your operations as easy to do as possible for anyone. It means uh, your infrastructure should be uh, used as, as code. It, it should be tracked in a, a version tracking system. You can deploy with commits and stuff like that. So now I would like to go into a couple of common mistakes people tend to do when, when uh, implementing DevOps and trying to do it. So the first, what I call is the DevOps team problem. So, okay, now let's say we are a company, we decided that we will do DevOps. This is all nice and shiny and on to the great future. So what can possibly go wrong? Because we all agree that we do DevOps, right? So when you go into the meeting and say to the teams that, okay, from now on, we, we do DevOps, and so that means this and this and this, and a couple of quotes here that you can hear back. So we are developers. Uh, we don't know how to uh, do this monitoring stuff. Somebody must build the tools for uh, uh, us to use. And then the operations people, hey, why would I give you root access to the production servers? How can I believe that you won't uh, crash it on your first day? And then, uh, of course, if, you, if, this, if this is a somewhat bigger company, you have some business controls or some auditors. Hey, we, we have, uh, we, uh, usually we have this operations team and the security team we can talk with about uh, how the processes work in this organization. How can we certify for the ISO standard if there's no operations team we can talk to? And then once you, you start realizing that uh, how to answer these questions, uh, some others come up. Okay, we, we, have, we used to be the ops team, but now everybody operates their own stuff. What shall we do next? And then how do, in, how do we involve uh, the mobile developers in this? Uh, or how, how would we involve uh, like UX guys in this or, or all that? And then the cross-functional teams start to build out. And then you have UX and product and QA and BI guys embedded in the teams. And yeah, well, we should embed the operations person also. And then problems should be solved. And then you, you end up with uh, an un unnecessarily complex mix of people in the teams. So 
uh, as a start, typically you have teams set up like this. You have development teams and you have an operations team. Uh, of course, there may be differences per company in uh, what permissions and responsibilities exactly belong to these groups of people, but this setup is fairly typical. And this will also result in that everybody is waiting for the operations team for some uh, uh, tasks to complete. And also, uh, the operations team believes that they are responsible for everything to make sure it works. If you uh, make the operations team start using these DevOps principles, they do monitoring, they start using infrastructure as code, they start building out tools for the developers to solve, you are not solving the problem. You are uh, solving only half of the problem. The, the, the operations people will have way more work to do. The developers will not be part of the solution still. So OK, let's try and mix them. Let's put one operations people in all teams. We tried this at Ustream. And it, it ended, we ended up having like five different approaches on how to build a Kubernetes cluster for an application. Because we had an operations team, uh, we, we had an operations person in a team which wanted a Kubernetes cluster for themselves, and then they just did it for themselves. And so this is also not very manageable and not very effective. So instead, you, you should, of course, always share knowledge and uh, build a shared responsibility and ownership. And avoid the terms that you are the DevOps person, you are the DevOps team. There's no DevOps team. There's no DevOps person. There's the team, and everyone does DevOps. That's a very important statement to make. Of course, if you can afford to have a team that builds tools for the other teams, that's nice, but it's not essential to do DevOps. For example, you should keep your original operations team around. Uh, we rebranded ours to the infrastructure team. The point of this is that they do not operate uh, the, the other team's services anymore, but instead, they build general infrastructure tooling. So they build cloud scaling APIs, for example, for the other teams to use. And of course, I, I frequently say this, we all row in the same boat. You have to tell this to everyone involved, and you have to convince everyone about this. So in the end, uh, the team setup looks like this. So everybody does a bit of development and a bit of operations. If you are on a service team, you, you build your own service and you operate your own service. If you're on the infrastructure team, you build tools for the service teams to use. We also have a team called Engineering Effectiveness Team. They build uh, development tools, like automated test tools for the other teams. This was one. The second one is... Uh, an even worse problem. This is called uh, the by the book problem. You know what this is. There are rules, of course. And people think that there are rules about everything. So there must be rules about how to do DevOps, right? And then we should just follow the rules and we should be all set. I've uh, talked to many people who who made this mistake, and of course, Ustream also made this mistake. So for example, uh, you can make this mistake not just with DevOps, but with Agile, with whatever. We first made this mistake with, with Scrum back in like 2010 when I joined the company. We decided that this Agile is really cool and we want to do this, and we read a couple of books and we ended up uh, like, okay, let's try Scrum. We want to do Scrum. And so the decision was made. The development teams 
we'll do Scrum. Every developer was sent to a two-day Scrum training where we had this uh, instructor tell us what Scrum is, how shall we do it, and then we went home. Uh, this was on a weekend, so sun uh, Saturday, Sunday, and then on, on Monday, uh, like 10 a.m. stand-up meeting, then sprint planning, and we started Scrum. Of course, it became a great mess. So we did, of course, we did everything according to the rules. So there was uh, planning meetings, there was planning poker, there was uh, uh, retrospective and daily stand-up, and all that sort of thing. Every team elected a Scrum master, and, but in the end, we just realized that it still doesn't work. And then we started to think, why doesn't it work? And we realized that we tried to apply the rules everywhere instead of finding out where this specific methodology would fit and use it only there. For example, we have uh, some very traditional feature development teams. They could use this Scrum method well. They have, uh, like, well-defined small feature sets to iterate on, and they can use it. But then we have like technology teams, for example, the streaming teams or, or the infrastructure team, where a project can last like six months or, or maybe a year. There's not much uh, sense in applying Scrum for a project like that, unless you can get an external stakeholder prioritize uh, and find meaningful value in small iterations. But if it's just like a one-year project and the meaningful value comes only at the end, there's no meaning to use Scrum. So um, this process where you just take some set of rules and use it without understanding uh, its meaning and its context, we call this uh, cargo quilting. You know what a cargo quilt is? It, it was um, uh, during the Second World War in the Pacific Ocean where the Americans were transporting supplies to their troops on the small islands by planes. So planes came, they threw supplies with parachutes and uh, the, the troops uh, based on the island, they went and picked it up, and their, that was their supplies. And uh, the native people living there knew nothing about airplanes or Americans or the war going on or whatever. They just uh, saw these planes coming and throwing these uh, crates. Sometimes they even found the crates, and it was full of interesting things for them. They worshipped these crates, they worshipped the planes, and then they started to build uh, some planes from like bamboo sticks and stuff, hoping that these planes will come again and throw more stuff. So that's, that's a cargo cult. So we call cargo culting when someone just follows the rules and does not understand them. So you must avoid cargo carting. And when I made this slide, I didn't know that I will talk right after someone from uh, Spotify, but uh, I heard a very good talk uh, from Daniel Bryant. Uh, it was um, about microservices and, and organizational changes. And he said that you must all repeat three times, we are not Spotify. And this is important because you hear all the time that, okay, we are going to reorganize our company in according to the Spotify model. I heard, hear that all the time. Even IBM has this now. So we have guilds, tribes, squads, all the thing. Which, okay, it makes sense to some degree, but you have to understand that by applying a model, you will not necessarily solve the problems this model solved for the original creator. So no solution will fit all teams. You, you rather have to focus on the problem you want to solve, the idea itself, and you have to continuously experiment. So there's this idea uh, in uh, the lean methodology that you have to iterate on everything, even processes. 
you, you, you do continuously improve all your processes. So it's a loop. You try something and measure the outcome. And, and if, if the outcome is better, you keep this change. Otherwise, you try something else. And uh, you do this endlessly. Like, uh, if your team works in two-week iterations, then you can try some new methodology in every two weeks. It can be a really small tweak, but you always have to keep experimenting. This is also true for DevOps. This is also true for all forms of software development. And yeah, so the third uh, group of problems I wanted to mention today is uh, organizational challenges. So implementing uh, some change, uh, of course, becomes harder if, if uh, the organization is not ready for it. But it can be even worse if uh, the CEO just declares that from tomorrow this happens, because then it's not going to happen. So even if it's a very good idea, even if it's the best idea in the world, if you just uh, dictate it to the engineers, they will not do it. That's, I think that's the experience of everyone who ever managed uh, software engineers, that uh, if they are not on board with the idea, they will not do it. And they will rather, first, first they just refuse, then, then they, they resist, and they even go and revert commits in the code base. Or they just shut down servers that you just launched for some, some, uh, some com concept. And then, of course, uh, they can just simply go and ignore uh, your rules. Or on, in the worst case, they will leave your company. And this is something you don't want. So uh, you have to really consider that even if you're the best leader in the world, you are not having all the information possible. So you have to bring people on board. You have to involve them. You have to make them understand what you are trying to achieve and how it will be good for them and how it will be good for the entire organization. And once you have that, you can give them autonomy to Im implement it, actually. So the, the good part is that if the people are on board with the idea, you don't have to come up with rules. You don't have to come up with uh, an answer for every question that was on the first uh, slide I showed. But rather, you can give the teams autonomy and say, OK, experiment, find it out, and make it work. And since they are engineers, they are good at problem solving. And if they understand the problem, and if they understand uh, what's expected from them, they will solve it. And uh, in the end, they will feel the solution is theirs. They will feel ownership for the solution. This is true for all software solutions as well as all organizational solutions. So the leadership should uh, refrain from uh, dictating and rather uh, let people, uh, rather just uh, facilitate people solving their problems. Uh, the other type of organizational challenges comes with organization size. And I learned it uh, especially when we joined IBM. But even earlier, we had these issues uh, between San Francisco and Budapest. You know, it's like nine hours of difference. Uh, that, that, that's very hard to balance, to keep everyone uh, informed about what's going on. So in order to have meetings between San Francisco and Budapest, that's a very short time frame, which overlaps in, in both uh, p uh, parties' uh, workday. So, uh, and of course, there's uh, the cultural issues. Uh, back with uh, Ustream, we worked with a lot of Japanese people. Uh, we, we formed Ustream Asia together with, with a Japanese company. And uh, we had uh, endless meetings where they were trying to explain requirements to us. And uh, that it just really didn't work well until we 
tried, uh, we successfully managed to get one of them come to Budapest and sit down to a whiteboard and, and explain what their customer expects from them. Because earlier they were just uh, defining small requirement pieces and we didn't see the picture. But this happens, this can happen to any other uh, work relationship where, where the, the interested parties are not on the same page or some uh, difference. Of course, uh, if, if the, the organization is, is uh, even bigger, there comes that sooner or later you will run into that there's a bunch of other teams having a solution for the same problem that you just solved. And then you have uh, some sort of internal competition. You have this politics that each team will want the big company to adopt their solution because that's, of course, a big credit for that team and uh, a big fame and uh, positive feedback for that team. So uh, I don't have a good answer to that, but you just have to know that if, you're, if you become a part of a bigger organization or if you already are, if you start something uh, in small, and there's a chance that other teams also will do this, and maybe their solution will get better traction because probably it is either a better solution or it's just closer to the company headquarters. This can, this can happen. And then in a, in a big company, priorities can change without uh, you knowing it. So for example, in IBM, we've seen uh, some efforts around DevOps come and go without further reasoning. So there was teams assembled, doing some uh, services, doing some integrations, and then they were put on other projects for some reason. And so sometimes uh, these projects are not uh, fully executed. This can be a problem, so um, I don't have a, a good solution to this problem yet. Only that I think if you operate a small team and you make a change in that small team, which really works well and you can show these results, you can probably lead by example. So you can show those results to other teams, Some maybe convince them to try your method and if there's enough teams using uh, your idea, then it might get adopted organization-wide. So um, that's basically all. Here's the wrapping up part. So the key takeaways, some Coelho-like uh, quotes here, but basically this is the key. You have to involve everyone. You have to stay open to new ideas. You have to focus on the goals and not the rules. And you have to be flexible, build trust, and share responsibility. And in the end, here's three books on DevOps. If you haven't read them and interested in, in the topic, then uh, I recommend uh, these three books very much. So uh, that's all. And thank you. And there's some time for questions. Okay, I have two questions. How do you measure outcomes in DevOps work in order to know if experiment succeeded or not from your experience? That depends on, on the experiment itself. So if, if, for example, the experiment is about uh, enabling people to deploy servers more easily, or then, then, then you just could measure deployment times. If the experiment is about... Uh, uh, in installing a, a process f about uh, like definition of what what what's a ticket and how is it done, then you could measure uh, tickets which are done according to the process and uh, tickets which are not using the process and this ratio of adoption. So it's it's really depending on on what the experiment targeting. Another one, how to convince your boss to accept DevOps? 
how to convince your boss. OK, so there's the Phoenix project book I just shown earlier. Uh, I will go back. And you should read those. Uh, the Phoenix project is, is about uh, exactly uh, a case where a software development project is uh, going very wrong, and uh, then they adopt some methodology and then save it. So basically, um, if, if you read these books, you will get, get some ideas on how to convince your boss. But what I would say is, uh, as a key narrative, is that you, you should show them that it is good for the customer and the engineers alike. And so, essentially, it's good for the business. So it will make them money, in short. You, you have to find out uh, the details on how will it make more money for the company, but essentially it will. So, and I think that's, that's a good answer for every CEO or whatever boss. Okay, another one. Um, how do you train uh, developers to become DevOps and how long does it take to become one? So how do we train developers? Yes, so... Um, there's two uh, approaches we used. Basically, one was that um, right from the early days of Ustream, uh, we had a very small infrastructure team. We called them operations at that time. And so there were no, they didn't have time <laughs> to build development environments and stuff like that for the developers. So the developers had to do it for themselves. So they had some uh, experience in uh, like, uh, installing servers and deploying packages and all that type of thing. And then when we decided to switch towards uh, DevOps, this was a gradual uh, process, we did trainings, did, we did workshops. So like a bunch of engineers got into a room with a senior uh, infrastructure engineer, and then together they completed some task. And then we did a series of these, and that's it. And the tools, of course, we use, what we use were uh, often selected together by engineers and, and uh, infrastructure people. So, for example, uh, the, the fact that we use Kubernetes was a joint decision of everybody involved. Do you hire DevOps people on the market, and how can you find them? So we don't actually say that we want to hire DevOps people, but we, we actually do hire them. <laughs> so, um, so our job postings uh, don't really say we are looking for DevOps uh, people, but we are looking always for engineers. And by engineer, we mean that you should have some experience in, in uh, system administration, and you should, ha you should have some experience with the Linux common line and some other basic skills. And then the rest uh, you will learn on the job. So basically by practice. OK. Any more questions in the audience? Anyone? No? Thank you. Thank you very much.
she regards an accent as a bad thing. Oh, that's good. Uh, what if somebody with an accent because they speak more languages than you do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we will have two microphones. Okay. No, so you're going to share. You're going to share. So you're going to share two microphones and four people. Yeah. It's going to be fun. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me just count to you so I can see how many people are attending this fine talk between a lady and three gentlemen. That's the first thing you're going to see. You've probably have seen their names. Probably some of you were this morning at the keynote, the first lecture of the day, the opening. We're going to talk about something that probably makes us all feel either younger or older than we should be. And uh, in, the, in the beginning of this conversation, we're probably going to address the issue whether AI is a myth or reality. And I don't know what you think about AI, but the first thing I remember is back in the 90s where I was a kid, uh, in, in games, games were better if they had AI. So you would have a, 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 an opponent with an AI, you would have a better game. But obviously AI is more than gaming, is, is more than a technical field, and we can see AI in almost any IT department today. Even big companies have started their own AI groups that are growing and they're becoming larger and larger. So these people in front of you will give you some answers, but they will also give you some questions for you to think about what AI was and what AI should be for all of us. So I would like to uh, start by asking Mr. Chris to give us uh, the reasoning why is AI today a topic in 2017? I think the main, the main uh, uh, differentiator to AI in the past, and it's not a new subject, we've been dreaming of machines that actually uh, find patterns by themselves and improve patterns. We've been dreaming of self-controlling automatons for a long time. The main thing that uh, accelerated in the last few years, and this is now exponential, is that uh, our machines and our computing became much more ubiquitous and much more uh, available. So the, uh, the speed of our processors and the amount of data that can be processed in milliseconds nowadays is amazingly uh, uh, high compared to what we had before. So a new mobile phone now has AI uh, or deep learning uh, neural network capabilities in the chipsets already rather than in a programming language on top of something else on top of something else. The other thing, of course, where it comes in is that we, ca uh, that we collected data and we're collecting every second millions and millions of data points from people using computers and just using the environments that they're in. So taking this kind of information, we needed a kind of way to have computers go through this information and find the patterns for us because it became too much for humans just to consume. We became these digital hoarders where we just, whenever we build a new system, we want users to put all their information in and then we didn't know what to do with it. We, we really as ourselves, we upload, for example, uh, photos from our phone to Google Photos all the time. We don't tag them, we don't describe them, but we actually want to enter cat and find all the cat photos and don't do anything about that. And that's why the, uh, the deep learning and the machine learning uh, we, we came from the idea of artificial intelligence to machine learning and now to deep recursive machine learning. And that deep recursive machine learning just jump-started the last few years because machines became so much faster and so much more capable to go through large data sets and data sets that are openly available because we've been collecting this information just by using our, uh, our mobile devices in our pockets and by using the web as we have it right now. Yeah, and uh, this is not a new topic isn't it, Mr. Panas? So this is something that we've known for decades now, but we hear a lot of things that we do not understand or have not been defined yet by people who should define them. So do we know what neural networks are? Do we know what uh, machine learning is and how to use it properly for the benefit of the humanity? Actually, I'd rather ask, answer the question you asked him. 
because okay. uh, I, you're right, it's not a new topic. I took a course in the late 50s from people who said they were teaching about AI. I considered it then and I consider it now to be fraudulent because they were not acting as scientists, they were acting as salespeople and hyping. They were trying to sell, in their case, the Defense Department on giving them more research money and if they just said we want to do this or that, they wouldn't get it, but when they said AI, they got money. And I believe that no scientist will use the term AI without defining it first because there is no generally agreed de definition. I also believe that the kinds of things that Chris Harman was talking about are simply automation, pattern recognition, computing, and they aren't anything special. I don't know that they're intelligent because nobody has told me what he or she means by intelligence. So I'm, I'm pretty strongly anti-AI. I may be the, maybe I should be at the extreme of this panel. Oh, we're gonna open some new questions, definitely. Uh, please, I salute, you are an engineer uh, by trade, and uh, what you actually do, you enable this AI things. So can you share with us, from your viewpoint, uh, how do we put AI into modern engineering? Yeah. Um, so my background is not building AI system, not building machine learning models. My background is in building infrastructure for Google uh, on a variety of different projects. And so the, the distributed systems I build, the um, ability I give to the machines to compute things on a very large scale, on an order of thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of nodes, and to be able to do this reliably and to recover, um, it, that is what enabled, the progress that we've made in that area is what enabled us to come back to deep learning and to be able to do that more efficiently and, like, and in a faster scale that makes sense for the engineering uh, in modern day. And so my background is in enabling that uh, more so than actually building the mm -hmm. models. But it's becoming faster and faster. The, the businesses are asking for more and more of these terms. Everybody's asking for the speed of pro uh, processing uh, in machine learning. They want bigger scale. They want it fast. They want it now. And uh, since we see that there are different approaches to doing uh, artificial intelligence, is it something that can be uh, driven with this amount of people, with this amount of knowledge we have, or we need something new to build these infrastructures of future? I think the thing that we're discovering is we're becoming more efficient at building those bigger and bigger systems. So most of the infrastructure projects that I've, I've worked on and even now I work on doesn't actually have giant teams behind them mm -hmm. because what we are getting good at is writing reasonable libraries that are able to, we are able to compose writing all the distributed systems primitives that we can build upon and uh, different people can contribute at different layers of abstraction without being experts in this specific layer. And, um, and this enables um, other machine learning specialists to share their knowledge in a similar way and other disciplines that can count themselves as part of AI because they build the packages that TensorFlow allows us to use the results of other people's work more efficiently and compose it. And I, I think that's where most of our power comes from is from finding good modular boundaries and from sharing it and being able to compose and find new ways of composing the mm -hmm. building uh, elements. So we're talking about modular software. When I was a student, I remember uh, we were learning about UML, and that, that was the first moment when I heard about Mr. Selich's work. And uh, every time I hear something modular, I remember, uh, I remember UML. And do we need uh, some formative ways of building uh, this thing called AI? Or we can just let it go and uh, find the different uh, approaches to do AI and be very free and open about it? Well. Um I wish you hadn't brought up the UML angle because it's a deflection. <laughs> um, yes, I'm partly guilty for UML, but I, I, I actually think we tried to do a good thing at least. Um, first of all, I'm a bit similar aligned or aligned similarly to, to what Dave uh, said. I'm all for using computer power to help us with very specific uh, problems such as um, language translation. A fantastic application, beautiful application, and we know what it's for. 
or, or I don't know, finding the shortest route um, at a given point in time and so on and so on. What bothers me, and it's an indirect answer to your question, what bothers me is this notion of intelligence. I actually think I know what people want, even though it's not well defined. As Dave says, nobody can define intelligence, but what people want to achieve with it has to do with essentially emulating human reason. Mm -hmm. um, that's really, I think, what, you know, by, by the term intelligence, because the only example we really have of what we most people consider intelligence is human reason. However, building that without associating human experience, because a lot of our intelligence is a product of the individual experiences and the group experiences that we have. And, and what really worries me is the fact that you can't put a program or an algorithm into jail. Um, what I mean by that is that the decisions that are made by these algorithms, uh, no one takes responsibility for them, yet um, they could be life and death decisions in some cases. So there's no notion of responsibility associated with it. Mm -hmm. And responsibility is tied into a whole bunch of things that are uniquely human. Um, one example I remember from uh, Weizenbaum's book, which I recommend everybody read, um, Com uh, Computer Power and Human Reason. Mm -hmm. um, he talked about the bombing um, raids that they had in Vietnam. And they said basically the targets were chosen by a computer algorithm and nobody had responsibility because all the officers involved said basically, well, you know, we just listened to what the computer said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do we need so, a lawyer in the building? Uh, hopefully. <laughs> so can you, yeah, can you sue the owner or the inventor of the algorithm? I suspect that's a, probably not a, uh, or, or and, and especially since the algorithm, as Chris was saying, are things that actually are evolving. So what we're trying to do is come up with systems that can evolve their own algorithms, which is where a lot of the fear comes in about what AI can do for us, uh, because it may do things not just for us, mm -hmm. but against yeah. us that we don't even understand what, how they came to that reasoning. So there's a good reason to be skeptical about this, and I think people are now trying to actually, uh, I think pretty hopelessly, but at least it's good that it's there, uh, establish some rules. I know the ACM is trying to establish a body of rules about artificial intelligence and so on, mm -hmm. but like most things that the ACM comes up with, it's, it's not particularly effective or, or um, listened to. Um, so I don't know, <laughs> you know, th your question was very pointed about artificial intelligence. I really don't know you know, what it is, except, like I say, uh, trying to emulate human reason. Okay, so uh, should we be afraid, Mr. Parnas, of AI, or there's something actual, actually useful about AI? You haven't defined the term, so I don't understand the question. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What I would like to propose is if you can't define artificial intelligence, whenever you think that term, say automation, mm -hmm. because everything that everybody's been talking about is automation. And we know what automation means. I didn't like the idea that it was the emulating human reasoning because it wasn't that long ago, maybe a couple hundred years, that the only people who could, or the only things that could do arithmetic were human beings. So then we built uh, machines that could do addition and subtraction and later multiplication. And uh, does that make them intelligent? Are those intelligent machines? I also think that the question of responsibility is a red herring. That actually engineers do go to jail if they make devices that are not fit for use. There are actually Volkswagen engineers that went to jail because of the diesel scandal. Not software engineers, they don't go to jail. <laughs> They're not real engineers. But, but whatever, that maybe someday they will be. But uh, I just don't, I think all of those are red herrings. I just think. It's very simple. If we all talked about what was safe to do with automation, what methods were good in automation, we could have a good, solid scientific discussion. As soon as we throw the word uh, art uh, artificial intelligence in there, we start talking about something where we don't have any idea whether we even agree on what it means, and I don't think we should do it. Okay. Mr. Hellman, uh, we, we had uh, a lot of success with these uh, AI things, whatever they are, in automation, in uh, using this technology to gain more knowledge about things. And you already said that today's world is the world of data, which means that if we use these paradigms and this technology with the data that, that other people have collected in our own name, 
without even asking us if that's the really th thing that we want. So can we use this data and these technologies better than we are currently using them? Well, for sure. I mean, I'm totally okay to give up on the term artificial intelligence if that's a problem, if you haven't defined it then, and call it automation, call it pattern recognition, call it uh, data analysis. These are things that have been defined. These are things that we know that we've been doing for quite a while. Um, my biggest issue with this is that while we are wondering and while the media is, uh, is painting us a wonderful picture of the all-thinking robot that has helps, uh, saves us from ourselves in the future, because we're in the middle of a hype. Of course people are talking about beautiful things that computers can do and they save puppies and kittens and everything while they're actually doing your calculations. But in essence, we are living in a world where machine learning and deep learning and pattern recognition is done and used in everything we do. Every news feed that you see online is being generated for you from your data and other people's data. Every image that you see has been manipulated to a degree to make you think about some things. When I, uh, when I saw the talk by, for example, um, Cambridge Analytica that went on stage and said, like, we made Brexit and we made Trump happen by using uh, Facebook surveys that, that skewed people that were on the fence in a certain uh, decision politically to understand who they are. They ask you which friend's character are you and that way they found out what your political ideas are and then that way they changed your news accordingly with bots that generated content for you. These are the things that are happening. So I'm past the stage where I'm wondering about what's going to happen with machine learning and, uh, and deep learning. It's happening. I want it democratized. I want us as, the, as technologists, as developers, to get out there and demand the data that has been collected from our users. I want us to get insight of, of what a Google, what a Facebook, what a WhatsApp knows about me. Because I'm not, I'm not worried about my information being recorded because there's no way to stop it. This is already over. Yeah. We've been recorded, we've been marked, we've been, a model of us has been made. I want to know how much that model is actually me or how much that wrong model could get me into trouble when it gets connected with another model. When you say people don't go to jail with engineers, I know people that went to, went to jail by, by, by writing algorithms that got people fired, that got people uh, in danger. These things happen. We are responsible for the systems that we're using. And just by saying like, okay, the system is, is clever and it does these things, I want to know what goes in and what goes out. We are at a stage where people readily give their information away for free access to things. Nothing is free. Your information, you're becoming the product. It needs to, we need to find out how to use this information, and I'm going to talk about that tomorrow, to make everything that we do with computers more human. This is what these things do. They look at the data and try to make it human understandable or take human information and take, uh, uh, take entities out of it and turn it into some things computers can do better with or match better to advertising. Our job right now is to bring the human element back to the interface up front. When I see something like uh, Siri, when I see something like Google uh, Home, or when I see something like Cortana, these things are amazing. But every single search form on the web should be that clever. So I, we want this the computer, I want the computer I saw in Enterprise where I can use a human question and get a human answer back. The technology is there, it's just not evenly distributed, it's only a few people control it at the moment. And I think it's up to us to ramp up our knowledge about this and give it back to our end users because they're the ones who fuel our economy by giving their data away for ad bloggers. Yeah, I think that it, Mr. Selich wants to... Yeah, no, it, it, it sounds like you've already pointed to some misuse <laughs> of these things. Um, and you're kind of hoping that maybe with some kind of mass movement we can um, control that. Uh, what chances do you give that um, to s succeed, given that it's the governments who control this? Um, in fact, they control the companies that, uh, in terms of which data they collect, et cetera, they actually dictate to the companies which data they have. So uh, the goal that you have is noble, which says let's democratize it, open it up so that we can understand what's happening. But um, I would say chances of that happening are very low. It depends. I mean, for example, the company I work for sued the American government for having the right to have a German data center that the American government can't reach, and we won. 
we are the only growing market right now. We're the only market in, in the press. Everybody looks at IT, says like everybody has to learn coding because that's what the future is. The robots are coming and you need to be as intelligent as the robots if you want to have a job in the future. So if we don't stand up for the rights of our users, nobody will. Yeah, Mr. Parnas, uh, can, we stand, can we stand for our own beliefs that we are engineers and that we are built to build this world? Well, I think we... Well, some of us are engineers. We have to define that term, too. But <clears throat> I think we have to be more precise in the statements we make to the public. For example, let's look at what the word learning really means. The word learning simply means collecting data that you use to improve your performance. So <clears throat> I have seen very simple machines that can do that. They collect data about what happens in the past and they use it to improve their performance in the future. And if you look into them, there's nothing intelligent about them. They're just very mechanical things that collect data and compute averages or compute sequences and so forth. So I, I don't want to use the word learning because I think it misleads people. I also <clears throat> don't really want my tools to be clever. I would like my tools to be predictable, straightforward, and reliable. I now have a car that <coughs> excuse me, tries to be clever. And I, I find myself fighting it because sometimes it thinks it's being clever and it's not. Such as when it suddenly decides it can speed up because a car ahead of it went around the curve. And I don't think we need cleverness. We need trustworthiness. Mm -hmm. Ms. Greenberg. Uh the big companies that we are talking about, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, they're building infrastructure like never before. Uh, we're talking about uh, hardware infrastructure, we're talking about software in infrastructure, and we are talking about these uh, technologies that exist in AI world, whatever this world is, let's not define it. It might be easier uh, to, to end this talk in, a, in, a, in, a, in an engineering way. Uh, can we predict what will happen with the knowledge that is needed for the, for the infrastructures of future? And I know that's related to the last question that I asked, but I want us to realize, is the knowledge, because we know that the technology is there, is the knowledge that we need to build infrastructure that will enable everyone, not only engineers, to enjoy this fruitful work of AI, meaning artists, meaning maybe even governments, maybe even, I don't know, politicians, managers of different kinds. But managers always talk about BI and predictive analysis. Can they talk about AI in a way that we can use the infrastructure we have and what, that we will have in the next couple of years to bring better to this world? That's a very big question I, that covers a uh, very wide ground. Uh, so I think Part of the question that you're asking is, can we have observability into what our systems are doing? And that's a very hard problem I spent many years uh, trying to improve observability of the systems that we have. And um, it's, uh, it's a very important field of making robust systems. And it's a very important consideration of having systems and being able to respond to issues as you see them and fix the issues how that's going to go in the future, there is a, given that more and more people are joining technology industry from all the different backgrounds, I am very hopeful that we'll be able to find different applications. Uh, my specialty happens to be very much, you know, in the infrastructure of things, building uh, the lower levels of the systems. But how those get applied, that's where we get a lot of different talent coming in from all the different backgrounds and finding new uses and making those uses available to us. So I'm very hopeful that we'll continue doing that and bring technology to many different industries as well. Are you working with uh, engineers only or your uh, clients or the people that actually improve the infrastructure that you build are coming from different fields other than engineering? The products I work on are, uh, I work directly with both engineers and product people and uh, 
a variety of different people and how that feedback, how the user feedback gets passed to us is um, a very well-defined process and that feedback does get integrated and gets, it does get responded to because building good products for the users is the primary goal. Okay. Can, can uh, I just um, sorry? ask yes. a question, a supplementary question? It sounds like you're saying, okay, we'll develop this stuff and then we'll find out what it's good for. Um, and we know that, by the way, any technology can be misused, and invariably it will be. Um, is this the right way, in your opinion, to go ahead and you know, say, okay, let's see what we can do, and then find out um, how it's going to be used? Uh, it's like finding a key on the street and looking for a door in which, uh, which to open it with. <laughs> Um, I think uh, that is not what I said, and I think this is uh, politicizing what I said. So um, I'm specifically talking about the, the techniques and the approaches used in the engineering part of it. I don't want to comment on the political aspects of it. I think both you and Chris are very knowledgeable, have spent a lot of time thinking about it. Um, I do, it does concern me as well, and I do think about it a lot, but it's not something that... I would prefer others to talk on this and weigh in on this. Okay. Sorry, I did not yes. mean to politicize anything. <laughs> yes, Mr. Parnas, you wanted to add something? Well, I again want to uh, rant against using words to mislead. Like, what's really good is automation. I've devoted a long and fruitful life to trying to make automation better, to trying to help people automate things. There's nothing wrong with automation. But sometimes we do things just because we can. And I'm thinking right now of those dumb machines on the phone. What do I have to say? Five, three, two, two, four, seven. And it says, I'm sorry, I didn't understand you. You have a raspy throat. And I would much rather just push the buttons like on the old telephones. I don't see where we've made it any better. And I think that it's a red herring to start talking about that we're just saying making things for engineers. Let's go back to cars. Cars are designed and the production is controlled by engineers, and they're driven by everybody. Even artificial intelligence researchers drive cars, and that's an extreme test. And I think that that's what we're doing, and I just don't think we need words like engineers. Neural networks, too. People talk about neural networks as if they could do something that a computer can't do, and then they simulate them on a regular computer proving that the regular computer can do anything the new neural network can do. We all know from computability theory that neural networks can't do any more than other, other machines. Maybe they can do it better, that has yet to be proven, but we try to make people think these are intelligent because they have these funny networks in there that's been going on at least 50 or 60 years. It doesn't help anything, and it isn't really honest. Mr. Hellman, um I pretty much disagree with this, uh, mostly because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm old and bored with technology as well, but I'm excited to see when kids use computers and kids use intelligent systems the way they've never done before. When I see friends of mine who are blind who can now use their phone to hold it against things and it tells them what that object is, or when I use Google Translate on my phone and I go to a Cyrillic sign and it, tra it shows it to me in English to, or in German to make me understand what it is, this is amazing and wonderful. This empowers people. This makes people happier. I'm not one to tell anybody what technology not to use. I want people to own the information that they have and understand how the thing functions. What I want is an end of magic. I want an end of computers or companies going up on stage and saying like, it just works, don't worry about it. Because that's really, really dangerous. And when it comes to like people driving cars, I want to see the numbers of many people are actually dying in cars every day because they drive drunk or they overestimate themselves or they don't want to do. I'm, I'm always fascinated when people get so scared about the coldness and the calculating thing of computers when everybody talks about like, oh, the Terminator will come. I'm actually more afraid of humans and their, their random, dis random acts of, of, of cruelty to each other without actually repercussion. When we said earlier, like, a human can be put into jail. When it comes to terrible, terrible crimes, uh, a lot, most of the time the people who do them get away. The people who actually were following their orders are the ones that, that actually get caught afterwards. When it comes to companies going bankrupt and lots and lots of people losing their livelihood, the CEOs are not the ones that suffer. 
So uh, I find it fascinating when we say, okay, everything, uh, everything new uh, is, is different. I'm, when it comes to automation, I talk to the German government a lot about what automation means for the job market. We are at a new industrial revolution where in the past when the industry came around, lots of farmers, lots of uh, handy workers lost their jobs because machines could do faster what they were doing. The main difference between this uh, automation stream that we have right now and the first one is that no new jobs get created. In the first one, a lot of jobs got created because factories were open. These were unhealthy jobs, terrible jobs for humans that machines would have been better at. And we learned that now, 60 years later, that everybody who worked in factories is unhealthy, is unhappy and doesn't, do, uh, doesn't get anything from it. But now we have, a mach we have machines automating all of the things that are repetitive and boring for humans away. So we now need to think what to do with work and with people in the next 10 years. Until 2020, there are some numbers that we need to come up with like 50 new jobs, 50 new workplaces that we haven't thought of yet. And I love that we can use computers and we can use automation to get the freedom to automate the, the boring things away to get creative about this. What do we do with humans in the future when computers do most of the stuff that we do? And I love this problem. Isn't it the best thing ever? Shouldn't we be in a world where computers do the boring stuff for us and we as humans can better ourselves rather than just chasing after money? Well, this is exactly... I have the microphone, so... <laughs> yeah, I'll pass it on. Okay. Uh, this is exactly what I was saying. I love the idea of using computer power to address specific problems. Again, what worries me is this idea of intelligence because as I say, to me, that is a striving to emulate something about the way humans work. That's the part that worries me because it's, it's not even clear what it's good for. It's called marketing. Sorry? It's called marketing. We, we define something as cloud and then it took us five years to define what a cloud is. You, talk, you say artificial intelligence right now in the Silicon Valley and you get funding for your company. It doesn't even mean what, that you're knowing what you're doing. That's the scary I, part. <laughs> I'd, I'd, rather, I'd, rather not, uh, I'd rather not fall for that siren song of like, oh my God, Elon Musk says like we're all living in a, uh, in a simulation. I'd rather deal with the problems we have right now that, we, that are happening. These, this data gets analyzed wrongly. We should do something about it that it gets analyzed properly. I just want to ask... Uh, yeah question of personal privilege. You introduced your previous response by saying you disagreed with me, and then everything you said I agreed with. So what is it that I said that you didn't agree with? <laughs> I'm mostly, the, when you said that you want to have a button, that you don't want to talk to something, uh, somebody else who grew up right now doesn't know the button anymore, doesn't expect that button anymore. You see kids uh, taking paper things and moving them because they think they can zoom into images. Uh, the ubiquitousness of computers that we have, the ubiquity of computers that we have right now, is bringing up a whole new generation that doesn't want our physical world anymore that we were used to do. Do you want a phone without buttons? I have a phone without buttons. We all here in the room have a phone without buttons. Well, one button, but that's about it. No, no but they, <laughs> they simulate the buttons. All my phones have buttons. I get, uh, I get a little screen and I go, boom, boom, boom. It's just a, a different technology for button. Look, I strongly believe that we just have to have shirts with buttons and everything else we can, we can talk about it. You can but, have a zipper, you can have a t-shirt. Yeah, maybe if we have a zipper, but I believe it, it will be really strange to have zippers all, all the way, right? But uh, let me ask you another thing, please. Uh, in the last five or six years, there's a term that has become a synonym to good. And it's a word, it's, it's a word agile. So today when you say agile, it means good. And please, Mr. Hellman, have would you, you talked please? to enterprise customers? Because if you tell them agile, they oh, don't, yes, they're they, not as excited about they're, that. They're not as, as excited, you're right. But for the, for the rest of the world, when you say agile, it means good. So my question now is, uh, is AI the new agile? Well, there's a few characters less, but you can make a agile, agile into AI, totally. Yeah. Just take some characters out and you'll you be see, there. Th this is, this no, is actually... it, is, it is a hype. Uh -huh. We're in the middle of a massive hype cycle about it. And uh, uh, we, 
and that started in the 50s and 60s. Uh, it was like space exploration, then it was like medicine, and now it's, we are the cool kids. We are the ones that people look up to to solve all world problems. And of course there will be people going up on stage and saying like, oh, my machine does that problem that humans can't solve. So yeah, we're in the middle of a hype cycle about it, so we've got to be very careful what we read and what we believe. So when a new system comes out that tells you, I'm an AI and I can do this, take that through the paces. Test that thing and make sure it really does what you expect it to do, instead of just going back to your client and saying, like, we can use this and then it does the job. A great example are chatbots. Chatbots were like the big thing the last three years. Everybody's like, you got to remove, uh, we even said chatbots on the new apps. And they work in China. They work amazingly well in China. Everything is WeChat because the internet is censored and crap. We have an internet that we're actually conditioned to, like, okay, I can go to a pizza website and click three buttons and order a pizza. I don't want a pizza bot to talk to me for five minutes what kind of pizza I want. <laughs> so uh, that we, we take models that are successful somewhere else and then try to make it a general approach. Same with agile approach. Not every project needs to be agile. Not every project makes sense to be agile. Uh, I wish some of them were more, but I also wish more people would use Agile the way it was defined, rather than just saying, we're an Agile company, with some waterfall components. Yeah, yeah. Ms. So, Greenberg, I would just like to ask you a question, and you can relate to the answers to maybe some one of, uh, some one of the guests. Um, what would you do with the time that you would spare by introducing some machines that would do a part of your job? What would you do with that time? Um, so, the, it, so I'll answer this question first, and then okay. uh, I'll relate uh, something else to uh, about the AI. So, I mean, the, the time. So. I am really big into automating. Everything I do to automate my job means that I will make fewer simple mistakes that I could have avoided by automating that. And uh, it is what allows me to build more and more complex systems. So uh, I derive a lot of benefits from automating every single workflow that I do uh, during the day. And that's also what allows us to keep team small working on such complex projects. So with the time that I have when I automate things, it allows me to think on more abstract levels how things fit together. And it allows me to reason through the system to ensure that I catch all the different edge cases and all the different corner cases and really think through what is the best user experience that can be provided using this infrastructure. No longer it becomes about you know keeping the system up and running and operating and finding the fires. At this point, okay, the system is stable. How can we make it better? How can we look into the use cases that users have and try to improve it for them so that the most common cases, the experience that they actually expect to have from the system are what we promise, what we want them to have. And so this frees up some, um, a lot of the bandwidth for creative work, which is something that machines won't be able to do, which is being, making the connections between the, if this component is put together with this and it's actually stable and I'm able to roll it out on a reasonable schedule, I'm able to give this new experience to the users. And that's, that's how automation helps me with um, doing more interesting work. And uh, to, um, so AI to me, uh, to answer your previous question, is um, it's a multidisciplinary um, topic in my opinion. Um, there is, you know, there's the machine learning, there's the role-based systems, and all of those connect different areas of computer science which, you know, all are under the umbrella of artificial intelligence. But to me what is really interesting is the different techniques that we use, right? So there's the statistics approach of it, and the statistical machine learning um, that we use. There is the, the optimization, which is the branch of mathematics that we use to be able to make the decisions and optimize based on some objective function. It is uh, using other approaches as well. It is using um, the neural networks that we talked about and a, a lot of interesting problems in that space of being able to explain why did your network, neural network decide this? And right now it's an open top topic. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting discussion happening. And so a lot of the system knowledge of this is how you do observability, this is how you tell what happened in your system at any point in time is what enables us to have better view into why did your neural network did this? Why did your neural network give you this answer? And I think given all these different branches of computer science and mathematics, I think there's a lot of different talent we can pull to try to solve these problems together from different perspectives. Yeah. Mr. Selich wants to add something. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, it's, there's almost near consensus here, um, <laughs> near consensus, that automation is good. 
Yeah, automation um, is definitely good. We um, can all agree. Uh, well, uh, there's uh, one dissenting uh, thing. Oh, but really? One thing I've learned is that you never gain, you know, I'm, I'm close to 70 years old. One thing I've learned is that you always lose something. Okay, when we got these mobile phones, we got an enormous amount of uh, minor conveniences. But I noticed, for example, in my teaching, and, and, and that it has had a huge impact on how people operate, uh, their capacity for deeper thinking. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's disappearing, uh, in, or diminishing, not disappearing. Mm -hmm. um, so my question to my uh, co-panelists is, do you think we, have, we lose anything with all that automation? Is all automation good? If it's not all good, how do we know where it is good? And, and if I can just add, since we're really close to the end of this discussion, what are you excited about when it comes to these things that we call AI today? Is there something that excites any of you? I know that Mr. Hellman is excited about this, but what about the rest of you? Are you excited about the technologies that we have today? Whatever their definition is, do they excite you, Mr. Parnas? Some of them excite me, some of them annoy me because they're so unreliable. Mm -hmm. But I just <clears throat> want to say, I, I think I'm more optimistic than, say, Chris is, <clears throat> even though I can't talk. Uh, and the reason is that I think that if we lose jobs to artificial intelligence or automation, it's not going to be because they're intelligent, it's going to be because we're stupid. When somebody improves the speed at which I work or makes it easier for me to get a job done, I want to do more. And when I look around this world, I see lots of things that are not getting done because we don't have the resources to do it. If they can free lawyers, for example, from having to do certain things in law, that means they can go out and help other people. If necessary, they could clean the street, which is badly needed in some places. But we don't have to be unemployed. Also, to uh, Brand's question. I think for every technology we lose something. For example, because we have cars, my legs are weaker. I've lost the ability to run that I might have had if I didn't have a car. Right? So we lo always lose something. We have to be wise about how we use it. And I think if we lose jobs to artificial intelligence or advanced automation, as I would prefer to call it, it'll be because we're not smart enough to make use of the resources we have. You can guarantee we'll never be smart enough. <laughs> Mr. Hellman, do you have uh, something for us that you can share that will enable us to see these technologies in a, in a more human way? Because you're searching for it. You're searching for more human ways to use technology, right? Oh, there's many good examples. I worked with a hospital, for example, in New York that does uh, cancer research. They, uh, they go through, uh, uh, through MRI scans and the doctor took like two and a half weeks, two days, three or four days to go through a whole scan to find something. Having a pattern recognition algorithm go through that data, cut that down to like two hours. We, uh, we looked at satellite imagery of, uh, of crops in Africa and could predict where diseases would actually start and get like whole, uh, whole harvests out, uh, out that would have died otherwise. We helped uh, uh, farmers in other parts of Africa by seeing where the water is actually missing in the ground. So rather than wasting water, which they didn't have, they only had to put the water where the crops were actually dry, rather than watering the whole field and hoping they, they fit the right things. There's a lot of great things happening with these technologies. There's a lot of insights. And even the simple things that I can talk to my phone and Skype, for example, and somebody else on the other side hears it in their language. It's just amazing. That's what Star Trek used to be. That's what I watched 1993 on television. And I'm like, I want this. And we kind of have this now. I totally agree that with every time we, we uh, gave, give something away with, uh, with technology. And I think that is our biggest problem, that the technology that we're using right now is seen as a given. Uh, kids these days don't know what offline is. They basically are online all the time, for, and they don't appreciate the, the, uh, the, the gift that is the internet that is an, a distributed free system where anybody can become a publisher. They don't understand it because it's always been there. It's a bit like we turn off the water and water comes out. We only think about it when it doesn't come out. And then we try to phone somebody because we don't want to understand it ourselves. 
So uh, the, the insight into technology, what we used to have when technology was not as advanced as it is right now, is something that we're missing. And I think that also comes to the deep thinking that you said. There was a great article in The Guardian years ago that our generation is, uh, is so good at solving problems because our parents allowed us to be bored. I had breakfast, my parents said, like, go away, come, come back at one, uh, at one o'clock for lunch, we don't care what you do in between, be creative, do something with yourself. And that kind of, uh, uh, that kind of consequence of ubiquitous computing and ubiquitous uh, TV, radio, people are always looking to be entertained. And a lot of these very, very clever algorithms are there to put, like, bunny ears on you on your phone. That makes no sense. There's great technology behind it, but it's just getting people uh, uh, to use it and consume it. So I want to I wanna get more excited about people using these technologies to better themselves. In essence, Wikipedia teaches you a lot of things that you didn't know before, but we're kind of not interested anymore. We'd rather just chase a news feed of information that entertains okay. us. So let's, let's just take this and... Carried, carried with ourselves that this notion of whatever this is, if it's advanced automation or it's artificial intelligence or it's agile or it's whatever, let's just take this technology and, and make it our own. Let's control it. Let's use it for good because in the end of things, this is what will inspire future generations in the similar fashion that Star Trek and Star Wars and some of the other shows for me was Dune, but everyone has his or her uh, dune or whatever. So use this technology and build solutions for a better world. Thank you, lady and gentlemen, for this fine talk. And thank you for coming here.